on Doubting Tom, Doubt and Thomas, and this week we're going to look at their walk to Emmaus. And um, I don't know if you could tell, but I picked all the songs to match. I have this thing where I just have to pick songs that match my theme. So Set My Soul Fire is about the having the burning in their chest and uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus. They didn't see Jesus until, well, you'll see when we get in the story. You'll see how the hymns all fit, hopefully. But just, an, you know it's a bad day when your twin sister forgets your birthday. It's a bad day. <laughs> you know it's a bad day when you walk into your office and a news team from 60 Minutes is there. It's a bad day. You know it's a bad day when your car horn goes off accidentally and remains stuck on as you follow a group of hell's angels on the freeway. I can make these up, but I think that's a pretty bad day. It's a bad day if your boss tells you not to bother to take your coat off. It's a bad day. It's a bad day if your income tax check bounces. It's a bad day if you put both contact lenses in the same eye. You've done that. <laughs> And all of these things can cause heartburn. Do you like how I got there to heartburn? Uh, because today we're going to talk about having heartburn because these folks in this story had heartburn. Now there are other culprits of heartburn like too many candy bars or spicy food late at night. But this is a positive kind of heartburn, not in a negative light, but a positive light. So let's read together Luke 24, if you have your Bibles open to Luke 24, and I'm going to start with verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named, named Cleopas asked him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Can you hear his frustration? And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us what, that, that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said. But him they didn't see, or Jesus they didn't see. So there's an element of disbelief. It's not really hit home that there has been a resurrection. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And he starts to quote scripture, Old Testament, to them. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, and he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which, which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. Hmm. But they argued, urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, and there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Amen. Amen. So... So Jesus, these, these two disciples 
We don't know. We, we know one is Cleopas, but we're not sure who the other one is. Are walking. They're downtrodden. They're walking to Emmaus, about seven miles outside of Jerusalem, immediately, maybe like Monday after the crucifixion. And Jesus comes to them, but they don't recognize him. Kind of like when in the Old Testament, Jacob wrestled with God and, and he didn't recognize that the angel was God. Or how Mary Magdalene was at the tomb and talked to Jesus, but she didn't realize it until he said Mary. So, so she thought it was the gardener. And then the disciples, when they were fishing and they saw a man on the shore who asked if they caught any fish, and he said no. He told them to cast their nets on the opposite side of their boat, and they eventually figured it was Jesus. So Jesus, sometimes he, he comes, and we don't recognize it. I mean, sometimes he's very active in my life, and I might not recognize him. In this instance, however, um, he came in another form. So we can't really be too hard on these two disciples because there's another description of this in Mark. And I want to read that. Mark 6. And it's a very short description. Mark 16, 12. Oh, I had it marked in my tiny Bible, but I can't see it. So Mark 16, 12 is the other description of the walk to Emmaus. Okay. Uh, Mark 16, where are you? I'm going to the eye doctor tomorrow. Just want to tell you. The glasses are not working. <laughs> okay, afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. So this is the other example of the walk to Emmaus out of the book of Mark. So in Luke, this Lupin version, it says their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Cary Grant once was walking along the street and met a man whose eyes locked onto him with excitement. The man said, wait a minute, you're, you're, I know who you are, don't tell me, Rock Hud." Uh, no, your um, Grant thought he'd help him out, so he finished the man's sentence. Cary Grant. And the fellow said, no, no, that's not it. <laughs> there was Cary Grant identifying himself, himself with his own name, but the man had someone else in mind. Sometimes we don't see Jesus because he comes in a, in a, a form or a fashion that, that isn't what we have in mind about Jesus. Jesus in John, that John, uh, Joe alluded to, goes on to say after that, what, John, what Joe said in verse 10 was he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And even after Jesus had been on, on the planet and on the earth and told his story, it wasn't until uh, he identified himself as, as our Savior that he ended up getting crucified. So the response was not a welcome mat when Jesus truly was known. So I want to look at what was the situation that caused Jesus to come to them? What was happening? It says in the Bible that wherever two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst. So one of the things that was happening when Jesus showed up and will happen in our lives is that they were having holy conversations. They were having intimate conversations. They were talking about this, what had happened and, and talking about trying to figure it out. And they were being honest and intimate. And so God shows up when as a family of believers, we have those conversations. In Malachi 3.16, it says, Those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. God touches those who care about the kingdom, and conversing about it will, will cause Jesus 
to show up. They were also very downcast. They, they were depressed and sad. Because, see, they had this idea that Jesus was going to redeem Israel. Jesus came to save them from their sins, and he thought, they thought he was going to save them from Rome, and that they, they would be delivered in a different way. And so they were just downcast, and they heard rumors about the resurrection, but they weren't sure it was true. But when Jesus got there, he explained the scripture, he let them talk, he let them grieve, he let them mourn, and from his interaction with them, he went from hopelessness to celebration. It is important to mourn and grieve, and this is a perfect example. And then Jesus took the scripture and explained it to them. So having somebody in your life when you're down that can help you understand scripture. And then as they were coming to the village, it said that Jesus acted like he was going to walk on. He's hoping all the time that they're going to offer him hospitality. And they do. It says they invited him to come in. And then something really happened because they were at the table together. Jesus, I feel, was at the head and he broke the bread. Okay. He broke the bread and their eyes were opened just like Paul's eyes, the scales fall, fell off when he was on the, when he was um, after his experience on the road to Damascus and he saw, these guys saw finally who they were with and it was at the point of breaking the bread. Do you see the connection between breaking the bread and breaking the bread? If you want to know Jesus, then we come together as a community, the base word being commune, and be together and break the bread. And Jesus, being the head of the table and breaking the bread like he did on the night he was betrayed, with, he had one difference, though. He had scars in his hands at that point. And it was at that point that they recognized the voice and the blessing and his nail-scarred hands, and their hearts and their minds were opened. And it said that at that point, they were so excited to realize that it was Jesus that their hearts burned. Let me see, what did it say exactly? When he was at table with them, he took bread and gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Their eyes were open. They recognized him and at that point he disappeared from their sight. They ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? So they were really experiencing something they'd never experienced before. And it was making their heart burn. Have you, and I don't mean that with Pepto-Bismol. I mean excitement and oh my gosh, could this be real? Is this true? And it was. And there's a, a, a word that is used to describe the places in the Old Testament where the spirit burned, like at the burning bush, or um, Jeremiah says his word is like a burning fire, or the seraphims were called the burning ones, and they call it Shekinah, Shekinah glory. And that means the place where God's spirit dwells. And so that Shekinah glory had entered into these disciples, the place where the spirit dwells, and it was like a burning fervor in them. And so they get up and they run back to Jerusalem, and it's got to be late at night, and they go to where the disciples are, and they say, you'll never you don't believe what happened to us. And they told the disciples, and they were there together. The burning must never go out. Is the burning in your temple, is it, is it a little flame or ember, or is it a burning fire? Do you need to get your fire relit? What is it like? Let me give you a story. In northeastern Uganda, clashes occurring between rival tribesmen, Cast, that there were cattle, there was cattle wrestling, and it was a major problem. And during the dry season, when local communities must move their herds in search of pasture and water, rival tribes seek to steal each other's cattle. 
The cow is the center of the tribal value system. In one incident, one tribe made up of more than 600 head of cattle, the Ugandan People Defense Force operations told the BBC, the Ugandan army daily attempts to reunite cattle with their owners. The biggest difficulty lies in proving ownership. The BBC witnessed the process beginning in a village north of Mubail. There was an elderly woman in the tribe who came and stood before the herd, and a remarkable thing happened. She called her cows by name, and to the amusement of the soldiers, as each cow heard her voice, they lifted its head and followed her. As far as the army was concerned, it was strong proof of ownership as anyone can find. So, so when you recognize Jesus, when he comes to be in your midst, when you are his, when you have that fire, you will know the shepherd's voice and he knows your name. And he is calling us to follow him, to give our ear to him. The shepherds call sharply from time to time to remind them of our presence. They know his voice and follow on. But if a stranger calls, they stop short, lift up their heads in alarm. And if it's repeated, they turn and flee. Do you hear the shepherd's voice? Do you have that burning inside of your spirit? That is our prayer today. Do you need your oil lamp relit? As we break bread together in the Lord's Supper, Talk, think about your spirit and how you can feel that heart burn in a good way today as we break bread and remember Jesus. Well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you 